Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm Rudy Maxa. Welcome to uh, another Thursday afternoon of segment of I Was Just Thinking. I've got a couple of uh, fun guests coming up. The first is Alexander Hirsch. You'll see him in the corner, in the lower right-hand corner right now. He is a, I guess, I think we can call him a progeny at age 27. He's a cellist who's done, uh, has performed solely uh, as a soloist for the Houston Symphony, the Boston Pops. His resume is a mile long. We'll talk with him a little about that. We're going to talk to him what it's, about what it's like to have to buy an extra seat for a cello all the time and also get a little background into his music. Um, and then at the half hour, Scott McCartney will be joining us. If you get to the Wall Street Journal, you know his column called uh, Middle Seat. We're going to talk to him about what you might pay uh, for your next airline tickets. Um, the fact is, airlines don't know how to price your tickets because they have no historical record of having to sell tickets coming out of a, a virus, which hopefully will be coming out of at some point. The airlines hope so too. So that's what we got today. We're gonna to talk to Alexander Hirsch, the, the cellist who travels with, who has to buy a seat for his, uh, his instrument. And we'll talk with Scott McCarthy at the half hour. And of course, as always, you all can join in. I'm gonna start with a wine from a Georgia, not the state of Georgia, but the country of Georgia. Um, I, there, these wines were revelatory to me. I visited Georgia at Tbilisi, and then I went up to the Caucasus Mountains in the winter. It was January, a year and a half ago. And I was just blown away by the country and by the wines. And slowly, American uh, uh, retailer, uh, retailers are beginning to carry Georgian wines. Not a lot, but I did buy this one here in uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul. Uh, it was about, I think it's about $15, $16 a bottle. They're about $8 a bottle in, in Georgia which is a great bargain and it's one of my favorite new countries to recommend folks visit. So from the seller of the week comes a white wine from a grape. By the way, Georgians have been producing wine or people have been producing wine in what is now Georgia for about 8,000 years. Try to get your head around that, 8,000 years. I've got the Georgia wine guide here that I bought while I was in Georgia, it's in English. Um, and I learned that from there. This is a white wine from the most popular grape in Georgia that's been around literally for centuries. Um, it's also grown in a few places like the Finger Lakes in region in New York, as well as in, in uh, Eastern European countries um, near the seas that Georgia is near. This is one of the oldest grape varieties in the world, and I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly. Uh, it's spelled R-K-A-T, Raxtisteli, Raxtisteli, R-A-K-A-T-S-T-I-T-E-L-I. Uh, these grapes, they dated back as far as 3000 BC. So there must have been some grapes before that. And uh, it's great for growing in Georgia because in the mountains, it gets really cold and snows a lot. These vines can stand up to that, but they can also stand up to intense heat, which Georgia has in the summers as well. Um, so this makes a very balanced wine. It's harvested late uh, because uh, they want to maximize the sugar because it's a highly acid, acid uh, wine. It's the most popular white variety in Georgia and one of the most common varieties um, in, in Eastern Europe. And Russia, by the way, loves this. Let me, I'll show you the bottle before I pour it. Let me do that. Um, it's a very simple bottle. And here you can see, I don't know, that's backwards for me. I don't know if it's backwards for you. Um, here is the kind of the wine that I'm talking about right there. And this is the winery, which is the Kaveri, Kaveri Wine Cellar. And again, these are available in the United States if you happen to have someone who's smart enough to distribute Georgia wine. It's a white. Let's take a look at the color. And it's one of these things commonly called an orange wine, even though it's made from white grapes. And you can see this is very, very sort of orangish. I've only drunk one orange wine in my life, not this one and not one from Georgia, but I had one in a very fancy restaurant the other day, and I wasn't nuts about it, frankly. Some people love them. I'll let you know right now. It's a big nose. It is orange. Oh boy, it is bold. This is again, something great with spicy food. Uh, boy, this would go great with Thai food. This is really interesting. Um, the orange is, is, is said to be what adds a bit of the flower uh, nose to it. I don't know why a color would add it, but it's still considered a white wine. On the bottle it says white wine. If you have a chance to try Georgian wines, red or white, they're incredible bargains, and I think they're very, very good. And if you have a chance to go to Tbilisi or up into the Caucasus Mountains in Georgia, I would take that opportunity as well. All right, 
I will sip this during the course of the show. It may be the first orange wine you've ever seen. It's only the second one I've ever seen. And frankly, because it says white wine in the label, I didn't know it was orange. But in reading about the grape, I saw that many of the grapes from the Racketstelli uh, family uh, turn out orange. Um, so there you go. There's our orange wine. All right. Alexander Hirsch, welcome to the show. Nice to have you here. I asked, I, I invited Alexander to get a glass of wine to join me, but he said he stopped drinking at 21, which is uh, sort of the opposite of what we all do, Alexander. Yeah, it just kind of lost the fun after it became legal. So I just, mm. uh, yeah, but uh, yeah. Where do you live? I live in Chicago. Okay. Isn't marijuana legal there now, drugs? I, I, think so. Uh, that's not really me either. I'm pretty you, clean you, as it is, but yeah. You know, I, um, I thought maybe when dope went legal, you stopped as well, maybe. So. No, no, yeah, no, it didn't work that way either for me, but yeah. When did you begin playing a, cell, a, a, a string instrument? When I was five. So I'm the fourth generation string player in my family. Uh, oh, my goodness. parents are both active professional violinists. Grandpa's a pianist, violist, and great-grandparents were professional musicians. So mom wanted me to be a lawyer, and look what happened. Um, yeah. Well, at least you went into an honorable profession and didn't become a lawyer, for goodness sake. I bet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have siblings? No, I hate sharing. Okay. All right. Uh, I'm going to show you a clip of, uh, well, not right now. Let's hold off on the clip for a minute. I just want to get a little more of your background. So you start playing at five years old. When did you become serious about it? And when did it first occur to you that maybe you could actually do this professionally? You know, it's so strange. I knew I wanted to be a professional musician from before I even started playing. I just knew. I just, it was always around me. Um, I wanted to initially play the double bass, but I was an abnormally tiny little kid. And my parents had to break it to me that they don't really make these your size. So they said, start with cello. And that's what I did, although it turned out I was such a tiny little kid that my first cello was really a big viola with a pin on the end of it. And luckily I grew somewhat and stuck with it. And when did you do your first public performance? You know, maybe I think I was about nine or 10 or, or something like that, but it wasn't. Living room. I don't mean the living room of your parents. Yeah, I, I don't have a, a specific memory of a big, I remember playing in youth orchestra and stuff like that, but. I think part of it because my parents were professional musicians, there wasn't this big ceremonious event for when you play. I mean, growing up, my dad would always ask, you know, they never came to my concerts unless I asked my dad, would they, is it gonna be good? And I'd say, I don't think so. He said, well, then I'm not going. I said, fair Thanks, enough. Man. Yeah. How's the therapy coming along on that, Alexander? Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm working on it, yeah. Now, did you, in your home, obviously you're from a very musical family, but was there a lot of music in the house? I mean, were there, was there classical music playing all the time? Did you develop it constantly? Music? Yeah, it was, it was constantly playing. It was constantly talked about. I mean, the value system was really rooted in music. Um, jazz was played a lot. The Beatles was played all through growing up, rock and roll. My dad, I remember a, a huge Led Zeppelin, Jimi Hendrix phase when I was eight years old and stuff like that. It wasn't so good with popularity in school at that age. My friends were listening to pop music of the day and I thought Led Zeppelin was still relevant. And this is like, you know, 2000. So, uh, yeah. Well, so well, this all makes perfect sense. So um, then you went to school where? After, oh. after regular school? Yeah, where? so I, I went to uh, New England Conservatory in Boston for my undergrad and master's. And then I got a grant to go live in Berlin. So I moved to Berlin for about a year or two. Um, and I enrolled in school there, but it's a very loose program. And I was really working a lot during that time, commuting back to the States pretty much every two weeks or so to play concerts. So, yeah. Well, when, when you get, what do you get a master's in when you get a master's? That's a very good question. Technically, it's cello performance, but this really? has always perplexed me because how can I get a degree in something I love to do for fun? I mean, it's just bizarre to me. My friends at regular university were grueling over these final exams, and I just had to play a recital. I would have done that anyway. What do you? I mean, I couldn't believe this was real life. Uh, yeah. And did you do four years undergrad? Four years undergrad, two years master's, and then a second master's post-grad thing in Berlin. So, yeah. What was that degree in? What was that post-master's post in? 
that was also in cello performance, but I wasn't, I didn't, I guess I hadn't received cello performance, uh, the Berlin or German Berlin. method. So, yeah. Right. Okay. And do you play other string instruments as well or no? No, I'm incredibly boring. I took piano for non-majors in college and failed miserably. It was very embarrassing and yeah, I'm still traumatized, but the therapy's helping. My guest is Alexander Hirsch. He is a concert uh, cellist. Um, we reach him at, are you at your home in Chicago? Your parents are your home? Yeah. No, I'm in my apartment in Chicago. We yeah. Reach it at his, 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 his apartment in Chicago. We're going to talk with him about traveling with a cello. He's got to buy So you have to, you, I mean, obviously, do you know that, that, that one of the first videos that went viral as a consumer protest was a, was a guy who flew United and they broke his guitar. Are you familiar with that? Um, I'm familiar with a few of instances of these airlines breaking the instruments. Yeah. This guy wrote a song. He's a he's sort of country western singer, and he wrote a song called "United Breaks Guitars" because for nine months he was trying to get paid for the broken guitar, and they wouldn't respond to him or wouldn't pay. And he wrote a song called "United Breaks Breaks Guitars," very catchy. I mean, Alexander, literally two million two million views. I, I think if you look at it, it's nine million views. Wow. United, I mean, it was a couple hundred thousand right out of the box on YouTube. Yeah. United went berserk and called him up and said, how many, how many guitars do you want? How much, how much money can we send you to take that down? He says, nah, I'm not going to take it down. And, and, and Gibson or somebody, Bender, somebody, Bender, somebody sent him new guitars. He wrote a book about it. I mean, it's international. It's still, wow. if you get a chance, go to YouTube and just click on United Breaks Guitars. You Will do. Now, obviously, you don't check your cello. Um, and our, our are airlines accustomed to this, accustomed to somebody buying a seat for an instrument? No, and it's it's really bad. When I was young, I was, I mean, I've been traveling with When you were cello. young? Well, when I was younger, sorry, uh, younger. <laughs> I, I've been traveling with a cello since I was like eight or nine years old. Back okay. then it used to fit in the overhead. Now this one doesn't fit in the overhead, but I used to terrify the flight attendants because they'd see this, you know, little kid walking in with this thing thinking it was all good and they'd have to tell me it's not going to fit. Um, but we'd put it in a coat closet or something. The really tough thing is international travel because the cello doesn't have a passport. And this is just check-in is a nightmare. Oh, uh, Who's sitting in that seat? What's the passport yeah. number? Right. And I, so this is just a, it's forever a problem. I hire a travel agent all the time. It usually goes better with the travel agent. Um, you have to know that there's certain airlines you can't fly. So Southwest Airlines just changed their policy that only guitars you're allowed to buy a seat for, not really? cellos. But so then people just start naming their cello guitar. And that's, I mean, it's, yeah. Well, let's, uh, let me, before we play that clip, before we ask Michael to play the clip, uh, uh, Larry, who's watching, says, who are your cello gods? Casal, Starker, Rostopovich, Yo-Yo Ma? All, all of the above. I love all those guys. I also, there's a bunch of uh, new guys I really like. I really like this guy, Nicholas Altstedt, who I was studying with in Berlin. Um, Yo-Yo Ma's, of course, a hero. And jean Guien Carras. I mean, it just depends on what rep. But those, the list you name is like the greats right there. Have you ever met old Yo-Yo? Well, yeah, I yeah. have. Yeah, yeah. He's a lovely guy. Is it was he was he kind to you? Did you play with him? Uh, sort of. We played on the same event, but uh, yeah, he was the featured star, and I was one of the the little ones. It was for a gala celebration thing in Chicago many years ago. Interesting. Um, let's see if we can queue up because I love. I was watching some of your videos on YouTube, and I just love your face, facial features. So as as you're playing, and you told me what you told me something before we went live about your your eyebrows. Yeah, well, I'm always getting in trouble for these faces, and to be honest, I have no clue that I'm making them. But one time in high school, I was in the string quartet, and we were playing at a competition, and the judges wrote on the comment sheet. They said we love the energy, but we were worried the cellist's head was going to fall off. <laughs> and I, I thought about for years just shaving off my eyebrows to kind of hide this, but I'm loving playing with a mask these days because of COVID. It covers up half of the problem here. So yeah, you got those Groucho Marx eyebrows. Um, let's see now, um, Alexander. If you can mute your microphone, we'll ask uh, uh, until we come back. Uh, we'll ask uh, we'll ask Michael to play this. 
Fabulous. Fabulous. You can turn your microphone back on there, uh, Alexander. Um, what were you playing there? That was Haydn's C major cello concerto. Okay. All right. Uh, I don't see you on my screen yet. My connection seems low at the moment, so I'm on audio only mode. As soon as my connection goes back to normal, the video feed will be reactivated. I don't know what that. How can I have low? I don't understand. So I'll just keep talking to you. Okay. I counted about 20 different facial expressions there. How many did you count, Alexander? I was up to about 25, but it's a loose count, you know, at a certain point. But it's beautiful, and it looks like you are so enjoying what you're doing. Yeah, I really love what I do. Whoops, did I just kick him out of the room? I just kicked him out of the room. I'm sorry. Oh, my God, Michael, can we get him back? I was trying to get my video on, and I kicked him out. Oh, dear. Oh, oh, good. Thank you, Alexander, for joining me. I'm sorry. I, I was trying to turn my video on, and I somehow kicked you out. So no, no problem. You came back very quickly. Well done. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, we were talking about your expressions. You look like you're enjoying it so much and, and, and that your expressions are reflecting the sound you're making. Is that too simplistic? A no, that's, that sounds very genuine. That's the goal. Um, a lot of it's intuitive. I just It comes out that way. I, I don't plan it. Um, but yeah. You remind me of some great conductors who, you know, when they're asking for sound, they make these, you know, faces appropriate to the, you know, the little symbol thing or the, you know, the big bring in, every, bring in every violin you can find in the room kind of thing. So, so do you, you play, you played with, how many concerts might you play in an average year leaving aside COVID? Um, probably between 40 and 50. That's like one a week. Yeah, I'd like to double it. That's my situ my goal situation. How can you do that? Well, if you certain uh, times you'll play in a weekend, you could play four four days in a week. You know, you play Thursday, Friday, oh, Saturday, see. Sunday, and you've knocked out four shows in one week, and you could do that every other week or so. And yeah, and uh, Paul here called you the Glenn Gould of the cello. Wow, that's very and kind. Charles said, "Beautiful, love the body en energy." energy. How, what, explain to me the business of being a professional cellist. Do you have an, a manager or an agent who books you in the concerts? They just call you up on the phone. Yeah, I do have a, uh, a management that I am now under. But to be really honest, you kind of have to be your own manager for things. And that's what they don't teach you in school. I mean, you really, it's a people person business. You got to have develop these relationships and get to know people. And it's kind of this, there's a lot of presumption that, oh, I just practice and wait by the phone. And that's so hands off. I think you gotta be involved in, you know, it's a team organization. It's, 
it's so much more than just that waiting by the phone, but that is part of it too. It's, there's a lot of organizations I play with. I started my own chamber music festival here in Chicago mm. and it's a two week summer festival. It's called Nexus Chamber Music. And the whole mission of it is to make classical music more accessible. So we do that by creating these high production value music videos and targeting small halls where we can better talk to an audience and tell jokes and talk about why we love this music and sort of keep the formality in a sense, but also make it more fun and accessible. I presume COVID has changed uh, your life as it's changed all of ours? Drastically. It was bizarre to have this forced hiatus. I've played one concert. Normally I'm gone the whole summer. This is my first summer home in 15 years. And I've played one concert in New York it, uh, a couple weeks ago. It was a live streamed event with no audience. It was very bizarre, but also wonderful to be back. But, you know, it's this whole thing is going to shape my industry very much. And, you know, it's just going to force us all to adapt. Mm -hmm. Cheryl asks, um, she would love to see a performance. What type of venues do you play? Maybe the better way to ask this is how does... Do you have a website? Uh, how does one track you and know where you're playing when? Yeah, so my website, www.alexanderhirsch.com, uh, is where I post the schedule to my events uh, of what, what cities I'm in, where tickets can be found. It's a bit empty at the moment because there's everything no sort knows. of in flux. Uh, but my festival in Chicago is doing a virtual festival, where and we're actually shooting all the content for that uh, this week, next week, and the week after. And oh, that we're great. just sort of trying to bring, so we're doing a live virtual concert. We have a bunch of pre-recorded stuff we've been developing and that I'm really busy with and looking forward to. And that will be posted on your website? That'll be posted on Guarneri Hall, which is a nonprofit organization here in Chicago. I'm very close to uh, G-U-A-R-N-E-R-I-H-A-L-L.org. And that's where we'll be streaming our 2.5 season, as we're calling it, from September 12th to 16th. But you'll put a link on your website. Yes. Which, again, is alexanderhirsch.com? Yep. And there's links to each of the days there, but it's through a different site. Okay. Um, Larry asked if you have any plans to concertize. I don't know if that is that a verb. I don't know. Concertize. Yeah, it works. Utah? Yeah. It is? Okay. In Utah? I guess you... I don't. In Utah? Uh, not yet. But if you know of anything, let me know. I'm easily accessible. And Peter asks, what advice do you have for a young people starting cello like his grandson, whose name is Drew? I would say stick with it. Uh, it's, you know, it's a very, it's a long road. It's very frustrating in the beginning in particular, because it's hard to make a sound on the thing, but it's a wonderful quest. And I think music being a part of anyone's life is just such a a novel thing, no matter if they go into it professionally or not. I think that's such let a me, wonderful thing that we appreciate. This. Let me ask you, I know I'm asking you not as many travel questions as I intended to, but uh, I mean, I, my dad, I'm an army brat. My dad was stationed in Germany for a while. I, I had to play the accordion and I hated practicing, you know, but uh, I have two granddaughters who live over in England and they started the piano. They love practicing. Although I've never seen kids love to practice so much and they've gotten wow. very good at it. Did you like practicing? No, I didn't. And I wish my parents had forced me to practice. I would have been way better if they did. I was out playing with friends across the street, but they did have one strict deal, which was in order to have lessons, I had to practice every day. Now, me being the clever kid I was at the time, I figured out they didn't specify the duration to which I had to practice. Right. So I'd practice for about 20 or 30 minutes, crinkle up the music, and they wouldn't know the difference. They'd think I was there. It wasn't really until I was about 12 or 13 that I started going away to summer camps and started seeing kids really play well. And I went, oh, I got work to do. That's how you do it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How, what have you had? So, so you just, you buy a regular coach seat and, uh, and, and uh, you, you, when you fly internationally, coach as well? Coach as well. It's, I mean, it's, uh, this is amazing. So one time, the cello, I was with my mom and we were flying, I was playing in Hawaii and the cello got bumped to first class for some <laughs> reason. And they wouldn't let my mom or I take the seat instead. 
What airline? I, I, I don't know. I think it was United or something, maybe. I don't even know what it was. It was ridiculous. So the cello flew first class, and my mom and I are in steerage. And yeah. No. That, it, well, you, you know, that guy wrote that United Breaks Guitars. You ought to write a song, United Let's Cellos Fly. United Loves Cellos. Yeah. Right? And, and I'm uh, stuck back here in coach. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, another time that was amazing is it was either Air Berlin or Lufthansa. I, you know, normally I strap in the cello and I've been doing sure. this my whole life. I'm pretty well versed in this, get the seatbelt extension. They wouldn't let me touch the cello. They said, no, 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 we have professionals. I said, you have professional cello strappers on call? What kind of, how often is this happening to you? Anyway, then these three huge galoot guys come in and take the cello from me. One's holding it from the bottom, one from the middle, one from the top. I was like, is this really necessary? I mean, I thought they were like, it was a wrestling match or something. These guys are strapping it in. I was like, I can't tell if this is good service or just over the top. I don't know. It took three people to strap in the cello as you three would normally Three people. Do. Yeah. And, and I'm not, I don't go to the gym very, you know, this is a very, uh, this is not a, you know, it's a 15 pound thing. Right. Right. Um, have you had any near misses, any problems? Yeah. I mean, I've had uh, problems get it. They won't allow the cello on the flight for whatever reason. What do you do then? You just, you just, you just don't get on the flight. huh? Yeah. You wait for the next one. I mean, it's it's really it's a pain traveling. Um, I've had some good fortune because of it. My favorite story about it was I was flying on Virgin America, and this was the day of the Rose Bowl, which okay. was happening at the time. I think in I was flying from Chicago to San Francisco, and I had a very early flight. And the airport was packed. I mean, lines going outside of the airport itself, and I was amazed. And the flight was oversold by seven seats. And every, it was like a tailgate party. I mean, everyone was going to this Rose Bowl, even though I was in San Francisco and they had to go to LA. And it was the it was University of Iowa versus some other team. And it was chaos on the flight. And Virgin America had a policy that the last people to check in get bumped. And there was a family on the seat, uh, on the plane, and they wouldn't move. They said, we have tickets to the game. They said, I'm sorry, our policies, even though you're on the plane, you have to get off. And I was in the bulkhead with the cello. And the guy came on and, and finally, the family wouldn't move. So finally, the manager came on and said, here's what's going to happen, folks. The first two people to stand up each get a $3,000 travel credit and we'll book you first class the next day. Pete, I look around, I was in the front row. So I stand up immediately with the cello and I'm walking right. away. And, they then booked me instantly first class the next day to fly on. They're thanking me profusely. I said, you're thanking me. I'm getting away with highway robbery here. This is Did incredible. you get two? Did you get $6,000? 6, $6,000 plus two first class seats. And I oh said, yeah. Um, well, that is a, that's a great note to end this interview on. And our next guest, Scott McCartney, who writes the middle seat column for the Wall Street Journal. I'll speak to him about folks who are giving you little problems with your cello, you know, because he can probably take care of that for you. Please do. Thank you. Andrew, excuse me, my son's name is Alexander. Where did Andrew come from? Alexander Hirsch is a concert cellist and he travels around the world and he buys an extra seat for his uh, cello. And those are some of his adventures. Hey, thank you so much for joining us, Alexander, and for letting us play that little snippet of you. AlexanderHirsch.com if you'd like to hear him when, uh, when the concert season resumes after the virus season ends. And continued great success to you, Alexander. Thank you so much for having me. Bye bye now. Thanks. Take care. Thank. Take care. I think we can welcome Scott McCartney in now. There he is. Hi, Scott. How Hi, are Rudy. You? So we had this cello player on. And did you hear that last story? I I did, and I was greatly interested because I I uh, a number of years ago I did a story about uh, cellists and frequent flyer miles and the problems they were having, and and uh, not only got to talk to Lynn Harrell, who was a, a fabulous, famous uh, cellist, um, but uh, Lynn, who, who's no longer with us, but uh, had uh, agreed to put a GoPro camera on his cello, and we were going to do a video um, of what it's like to travel as uh, uh, Cello Harrell. Um, but Cello Harrell had its own Delta Airlines SkyMiles account, 
And and Delta Delta decided at some point, as did other airlines, that you actually had to be a person to collect frequent flyer miles. And the and the cellists were very upset because they quite legitimately they buy a seat uh, sure. for the for the instrument, and so they should get all the benefits. Well, the next time you do a journal column on you know people getting bumped, um, I, I'll happily provide you with the uh, with contact information for Alexander Hirsch because that's a funny story. Excellent. Yes, yeah, so that's I'm great. Going, we're here for 6,000, we're, we're, we're all yours, right? Yeah, yeah. That's great. Well, let's get down to the ugly business now, Scott. Scott, as, you, as I said at the beginning of the show, is uh, writes the middle seat columns every Thursday in the Wall Street Journal. Did, is there one today? You're on vacation. Uh, there is not, I am on I, vacation this week, but, uh, but doing I this with you. I looked today very quickly, I didn't have time to read the whole paper, but I wanted to make sure I was up to date with you and I didn't see your, your column, so. Yeah. So it's sort of a drab Thursday around here without a Scott McCartney column. How long have you been doing that column? Uh, the column actually started um, uh, in January after 9-11. Uh, wow. So in January 2002. And it, and it started as kind of a notes thing and, and just took off. It was it was a couple of years before it became a regular fixture in the paper. Um, but um, 15, 16 years you've been writing. The, that's extraordinary, yeah. isn't it? Um, it's it's a long time to do a weekly column. It's uh, uh, you know my great fear is I'm going to run out of ideas. Uh, yes. But, but this is the industry that keeps on giving, and um, I have not run out of ideas yet. I know the tune. I do a weekly newsletter, and of course this weekly webcast. Sure. And every when it's all done, I go, well, I don't. Who am I going to have my guest for next week? Or what am I going to write about in the newsletter? And of course, yeah. I was a weekly columnist at the Washington Post and at Washingtonian Magazine. Excuse me, monthly at Washingtonian Magazine. And every time you finish one, it's like, you know, you get maybe a day of relief and then you're, I've got nothing to do next week, but you keep coming up with winning ideas. Let's talk about one of them, which was uh, a couple of weeks ago, you wrote about how airlines have no idea how to price tickets in the, in the, in the coming several months, because usually they have, well, you can explain why. Yeah, well, it, it was fascinating to me. Um, uh, airline revenue management is, uh, you know, a very complicated science. Um, p- people get PhDs in this. Uh, it is it is really the reason why um, ticket buying can frustrate consumers so much, uh, the, why prices change so frequently, why there is so much inconsistency to it. Uh, the airline is constantly figuring out how to how to squeeze every single penny out of it. And all of that squeezing is based on history. Uh, Airlines uh, know what the demand is for the Tuesday flight to Cleveland on the third week of October at 2 p.m. And that's based on what happened last year, what what happened uh, several months before. Um, It's a seasonal business, but they uh, they track trends, they uh, they keep track of events, everything you can imagine. Um, so that it seems like, you know, when you go shopping for a ticket, they know they knew you were coming and, and they're ready for you. Um, so they so they can so they can extrapolate what that week in August next year to the, from A to B. Right. What the demand will be, how much they can get away with charging, et cetera, et cetera, yeah, the, based on based on past records. But we have no right. past records for a vibe. For That's a, right. a vibe, the history is gone. The history is gone. So um, the whole notion of how many seats do you hold back for last minute travelers, because that's where you get the highest prices, um, they're right. blind. They have no idea uh, what's going to happen. And and it's both a product of there's just no demand. There's no business travel. There's no so there's just not going to be a whole lot of people showing up at the last minute to buy tickets. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, they have no idea how to price the cheap tickets weeks in advance because th- that history is gone. And, and the even more fascinating thing is, so they're, they're blind right now, but then what happens next year when they have this history of the pandemic, which will not be, they hope, applicable at all uh, to what ticket buying will be like a year from now. Um, so it has thrown the systems into chaos. It, it has left uh, the airlines with, without any good measure of uh, what demand is, how to price tickets. And and you can see this, you go shopping for tickets and you can see the exact same price in September, October uh, of this year, a, as you'll see for spring break next year or in June next next year, when you think that there would be a whole lot more demand, but the pricing systems are just, uh, you know, defunct right now. 
So people have been asking me, oh, are, are tickets, you know, next month really going to be on sale because nobody's flying? Uh, or, or, or are they going to be really high because the airlines want to make money with every ticket they sell? What did you find in researching your piece? And I see, are you still on camera? Uh, you may I am. Yeah. Okay. I, my, says my connection's low. This has never happened to me before. Uh, I seem to be off camera, but at least you can hear me and I'll be back at some point. And I have paying a lot of money for high speed internet here. <laughs> there were penalty points will be assessed. There we go. There you go. Um, so what did you find? And did you find airlines are going, yeah, we're going to have to like lower, keep the fares low to get people to come back on. You know, it really, it really didn't. Um, I, I, that, that will come, I think, but it hasn't come yet. Um, airlines know that the people flying now really have, have to, to fly. A lot of them yeah. are, are first responders, medical care workers. They don't want to be in a position where they look like they're gouging those folks. Um, on the other hand, they, they, those folks have got to fly. So they're going to fly whether the fare is $19 or whether it's $200. And so they might as well charge them $200 or whatever they think is a, is a reasonable fare. They, they also don't want to, they're just not in a position yet, I think, where, where there's the consumer confidence to try and stimulate demand. I mean, usually after, you know, after 9-11 and, and cockpit doors get put in place and you want to you want to get people flying again, there would be the great sales um, to get people to say, yeah, okay, let's go fly. Um, but that we're not there yet. Uh, there's not the, there's too much worry about the virus and about spreading the virus. And so it would be unwise for airlines to uh, say, oh, let's get everybody going again. Two questions. Uh, one is, it seems to me though, that international tickets seem to be priced very favorably on many airlines, not all, not all, but on you know some um, for sales in the future. Even though we don't know if we can, as Americans if we can fly in the future. And the second thing I should know, but I you keep on top of this more than I do. Ha, have most of the airlines extended out the the time you can ca cancel if let's say you buy a ticket for Paris two months from now and France still isn't allowing Americans? Can you get a full refund still? Uh, if you if you buy a ticket now for Paris, you would get a a full voucher. Um, you wouldn't get, they have waived the change fees, but not necessarily a full refund unless they cancel the flight. Um, it would be the, the same rules that are, that are in place today. Um, the airline has to cancel the flight if you want a full refund. Otherwise, you're going to get a voucher. Um, but there would be no change fee. Um, okay. And, and that's, you know, the other part of the question, the, the cheap, cheap prices, um, international flights is, is one area where what they are flying, they're basically flying for cargo. Uh, there are some people going, there's some, you know, diplomatic traffic, dual passport traffic. There are a few people uh, traveling internationally, but 87, 90% of international flying is just gone. It's, it's, it's non-existent. Um, so the flights that, that are going for cargo, that, that is a case where they figure, well, we might as well put some, if we can get people on, we'll be cheap and we'll, uh, cheap fares and we'll put people on. I saw a piece the other day, I don't know if it was in a, in a, in a traveler's blog, uh, that Qantas was, I think it was Qantas, was flying, there's some rule in, that they can only take 30 passengers, on some very limited number of passengers on a plane, and so they were only booking people willing to pay business class fares um, hmm. because they didn't want to you know, waste any of these precious seats on, on the rest of us schmoes. Yeah, I, I, I hadn't seen that. Um, it, it, you know, it intuitively makes sense. Uh, the, uh, Australia and New Zealand, um, some of the hardest hit areas for travel because of the restrictions of getting in and out of the country. You, right. you can't go there. So if you, if you do have to go, um, you know, and it kind of makes sense that if they're, if they're only going to have 30 people on the plane, but they, those are people who have to go. They're not going for vacation. They're not going... Uh, because they want to see their grandkid or or whatever, that's just not allowed. Um, so it it is uh, most likely government or or business travel that uh, that they will pay for. I, I do think business class is a fascinating question because what really matters to people now on an airplane is space, and mm -hmm. and I think the demand in some ways, although demand is going to be. Uh, a long, it's going to be depressed for a long time, particularly business travel demand. But I do think there is an element here where a lot of people are going to say, I don't want to be in the coach cabin with, with somebody packed in, you know, right next to me. 
uh, I would feel much safer in a business class pod where you get your own, in some cases, get your own sort of enclosed uh, space. Um, and so for the people who are traveling, that may be become, become not just a, hey, I, I want a business class seat so I can sleep, or I want a business class seat because the food's better. Uh, it's going to be, I want a business class seat because I think it's safer for my health. So you think they'll raise fares on business class because they can get it? I, I think they would be more than happy to be able to get the $7,000, $10,000 that they what had they been getting. Uh, uh -huh. You know, we'll see. Uh, Larry Rice, if the flight time changes by 90 minutes or longer with Delta, you get a full refund, not a credit. I believe this is the same for most airlines now. Well, uh, Delta is 90 minutes. Uh, American, I believe, is 60 minutes. Uh, United is two hours. Uh, United okay. had gone um, uh, quite, quite famously. United went to uh, first uh, 23 hours, I think. Then they came back to, uh, to six hours. Um, but uh, it, which knocked a whole bunch of people out. They had been um, previously at two hours and they got a lot of pressure from the government to go back to two hours. So it really depends on the airline's rules. Uh, the only DOT requirement is if there's a significant change and the, and the word the government uses is significant, but it doesn't define it. A significant change because, the can because of the cancellation if the new flights that the airline's offering are significantly different, you can get a refund, not a voucher. Um, and each airline defines significant in its own way. Oh, gosh. So do uh, the moral here is if you're going to buy a ticket on any airline, be sure you get the rules down before you, you buy and make sure you can live, live with those rules. Uh, Cheryl asks, oh, this is, here's an age old question. I, I, know, I know Scott can answer this one. Even I can answer this one. Uh, what, is the, what is the day and time to get the best price on buying tickets. Uh, I think we have to say non-COVID wise because Lord knows what it is now, but generally is there a time or day when it's best to go online and buy a ticket and look for the best price? You know, it, it's it, um, the, the data suggests that uh, there's not a great difference anymore. Um, you know, it used, it used to be Tuesday, right? It used to be that uh, the, the Airline pricing people would come into work on Monday and they would see how sales went over the weekend and they'd say, oh, gosh, we, we didn't do very well. We got to cut prices and the ads would go into the newspapers for Tuesday and the sales would come out Tuesday and Tuesday was the day to go. Um, then more recently, uh, data shows that uh, the weekend, Sunday in particular, is, is really the better time to do it. Um, airlines have so much more control now over when they can put cheap prices out into the marketplace. Um, that they're more likely to do it on the weekend when business travelers aren't buying tickets. So what you what you don't want is the corporation taking advantage of the really cheap price. So put it out there on Sunday when you know that the corporate travel agencies aren't booking anything. And then Monday morning, the, the price goes up higher. In the old days, I remember the, 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 the story was that prices, airlines would raise their prices on Friday and 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 see how it went over the weekend and then on monday morning their competitors would would try to say either match it or undercut them depending on how the de demand went it certainly is the bu a business of sharks are you, are you gonna write a book i know i i think you have you didn't you put out a book a, quite a while ago on advice on travel and so on i, I did i did it, I it. it was the it was the um the wall street journal guide uh, to power travel and, and the, uh, the subtitle was uh, how to arrive with your uh, dignity, sanity and wallet intact. Um, so, is it time uh, for an update, Scott? Uh, you know, pr it probably is. Um, I think it would have to wait until we see yeah. what the world is like after the after the pandemic. But um, yeah, no, it's a it's a good idea. I, I know airline pricing executives aren't doctors, but are any of them saying to you, you know, we think this will all be, be okay by March or by February or by April. I mean, is anybody smart saying anything that sounds smart or is it a crapshoot for everybody? Uh, you know, I, uh, it, is, it is different at different airlines. It's fascinating to me how they each have sort of different uh, outlooks on what the future will be. Um, I think all of them are betting on a vaccine and an effective treatment. Uh, I think they all think it'll take both a vaccine and an effective treatment. Um, to get people traveling again. I think they all realize that short haul travel will come back sooner. 
Um, it'll take some time before people feel confident in going far afield because they don't want to get stuck somewhere. They don't want a sudden outbreak uh, to close borders and leave them trapped. Um, and I think they, they all agree that it'll take more time for business travel to come back than leisure. But it's fascinating to me. I mean, and as of very recently, American Airlines, for example, their executives were thinking they were going to be at 100 percent by next summer. Um, and it'll be a smaller airline because they're grounding their 757, 767s and A330s. But they think all of their planes will be out of storage and they'll all be flying next summer. Um, you don't hear that from other airlines. Uh, and so it'll be interesting to see if, they, if that pans out or not. And Americans have been most aggressive in bringing back flights, hasn't it? Yeah, yeah they really have. They, uh, they, they turned Dallas-Fort Worth into the busiest airport in the world. They've, they've really built up in Charlotte. Um, it's, uh, you know, there, it's much more connecting traffic than nonstop traffic, uh, because, but they think that there are people who need to fly. And so while, uh, United has really hunkered down, um, for example, and, and really aggressively grounded, uh, everybody is aggressively raising cash, um, but they're, they're trying to conserve as much as they can. American looked at it and said, you know, the, with the government stimulus uh, bailout package, the government's basically paying for uh, airline labor this summer. Uh, fuel is pretty cheap. So why not see? Um, I don't think they envisioned the spikes that, that a lot of communities have had that have cur curtailed a lot of summer travel. But that was that was their hope that things would really start coming back this summer. My guest is Scott McCartney. He writes the every Thursday, the uh, except this week he's on vacation, um, the middle seat column for the Wall Street Journal, where he takes a close look at airlines generally. Also, you also do hotels and some other uh, uh, other forms of leisure and business travel, but primarily the airline industry, which is why it's called the middle seat. And speaking and speaking of the middle seat, uh, Crystalinda, Crystalinda, what an interesting name, um, says very interesting information, Scott. We like Southwest middle seat being vacant. It feels safer. Wayne wants to know. Uh, will any of our airlines go out of business during this time? Um, you know, go out of business is a very strong term. <laughs> right. um, uh, you know, what we've seen in the past is uh, it, it, if if things continue, I think you can see uh, you would see some airlines uh, end up in bankruptcy reorganization. Um, they yeah. likely won't go out of business. Um, but they, they, you know, they will have to um, reorganize and um, might end up being acquired by other carriers, depending on who it is and the size and all that kind of stuff. Um, and I think you could see some structural changes in, in, in the business. Um, I, I, a long time ago in a previous downturn, a wise Wall Street investor once said to me that um, he, what, one thing he was certain of was that there would always be airlines. They just might have different names. Right, exactly. I, uh, uh, by the way, the uh, his Scott's column called "The New Edge for Fl for Flyers on Airfares," uh, subtitled the, "How the Pandemic Has Completely Confounded the Pricing Computers." That was August sixth, and his most recent column, August thirteenth, was on frustrated travelers battling for refunds. I thought that had sort of all been settled until I read your column, but apparently uh, it's not. Yeah, no. It, I mean, this is. Uh... It's not going to be settled for a long time. There, there's, you know, I think there's well more than a billion dollars at stake here. Um, there are still international airlines that are refusing to pay refunds that uh, for for trips that they canceled that they should be required to pay refunds. Uh, there are still airlines uh, delaying uh, paying refunds. Um, there's still problems at United with the changes that they've kept putting through and people calling up and saying, hey, you know, you told me I had to take a voucher, but now you changed your rules, so I should be able to get a refund. And and they should be able to get a refund, but uh, but the airline is telling them they can't. It's a big problem. A double question from Mark. Would you feel comfortable and safe taking a long international flight? And are the interiors of planes and seating configurations going to change because of COVID? Um, I would feel comfortable. I did a lot of research on this, and there is uh, there is very strong evidence that the air circulation on an airplane um, it, it, at cruise altitude uh, creates a very safe environment. Um, uh, there is strong airflow, um, and the air is is cleaned in uh, in very effective filters that can catch virus. Uh, Fifty percent of it comes from the outside. The flow is all straight down. 
Uh, and so the cabin itself is, is a good environment. Uh, the problem is if you're sitting next to somebody who's sneezing and coughing and you know ventilation may not help. Uh, and then we have the, the situations where you you get on the airplane and boarding or you're you're, you're deplaning and you're, you're sort of in a sea of a crush of of different uh, people and and that uh, can be dangerous. So I think if you're going to take a long trip, um, you have to take precautions. Uh, do I think the seating is going to change? I, you know, I, I really don't. Um, the economics dictate that um, you just can't do away with middle seats uh, on, on, on many aircraft. Um, I think there may be increased popularity of premium economy as a way for people to, at an affordable price, um, buy up to some more space so you're not elbow to elbow. Uh, but, um, uh, you know, by and large, uh, and this, this is why we're going to have to get to vaccine and, and treatment so that people feel like even if they get the virus or, the, or that the, the chances of them getting the virus are, are quite diminished. Uh, you got to get to that before people will feel comfortable in a, in a tightly packed airplane cabin. Are you a frequent flyer maniac? Do you, do you chase status and miles? You, um, it, you know, I, I do care. I, I care because my readers care. I care because um, I want to understand the business and, and all of the complexities of it uh, and where you can get an advantage and where you can't. I, I'm at a disadvantage because I fly a lot of different airlines. Um, so just uh, to sort of keep up with things, uh, I don't, uh, you know, I, I concentrate on, I live in Dallas. I fly a lot of American. I fly a lot of Southwest. Um, but if I'm not flying United and Delta and, and lots of others uh, or international airlines when I'm going to Europe or Asia or wherever, uh, you know, it's it's um, what it's, you're saying is you can't accumulate enough miles on an airline on one single airline to reach uh, their higher levels of elite status quick, easily. That's what you're saying. Yeah, no, I, I can. I can by and large because I travel a lot, can by and large on American and Southwest. Um, but. I'm, I'm not going to fly enough to get to Delta Diamond or that, that kind of thing. When people tell you that miles aren't worth anything, accumulating miles aren't worth the effort, what do you say? Uh, I say it's all about the perks. Um, and, the, and the perks have diminished uh, some. Um, but, uh, you know, I think um, uh, the ability to reserve extra legroom seats is huge. It's huge for me. I, you know, six foot one, I, I care about. Uh, extra legroom seats. Um, the uh, early boarding and other things, um, that becomes Im important to people. Um, I do think, by the way, uh, that we're going to have very much a buyer's market for uh, award seats as we as we come out of this. Um, I, I do think if you have a stash of frequent flyer miles, uh, it, there's going to be a good time uh, ahead when people do start traveling that you're going to be able to find uh, plenty of availability for premium award seats. Well, that's good news. Yeah. That's very good news. I, I, uh, do you get my newsletter? What? I do, yeah. Oh, you mm -hmm. do? Oh, good. Well, I did, a, I did a column a couple of weeks ago on are miles worth anything, and I pointed out, you know, Marriott, or no, it was Hilton, and, uh, and uh, I guess British Airways or something, you know, buying a billion dollars worth of miles to give to their – flyers and et cetera, et cetera. I think that sort of answered the question about whether miles are worth anything. I well, mean, that's yeah, an they're, enormous amount of money. They're, they're worth a lot to the banks still. Right. American Express bought a billion dollars worth of uh, British Airways. Obvious, we've seen American Express. It's essentially a credit deal. They, they, they buy them in advance at, at cheap. That gives cash to the airline. Uh, and uh, it's a good deal for the bank, a good deal for the airline. Where are you on holiday, can I ask? Uh, Cape May, New Jersey. No, is that is that home to you, somehow related to? No, I, no, I have uh, I have a daughter who lives in Washington D.C., and so it was something close by uh, that we could. Um, uh, we we both needed a change of scenery. She she works on Capitol Hill in Washington, and um, we 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 both needed to get away. <laughs> For various well, reasons. I'm, well, I have a lovely time with, with your daughter. Well, thank you. And thank you so much for joining me today. I'm sorry about the technical hiccup there, but uh, no problem. As, as they say on MSNBC, it's the times we're in. Every time there, one of their guests freezes, you know. But right. uh, 
I appreciate it. Have a lovely time at the beach. And Scott, it's good to see you. I'd like to see you in person sooner rather than later. I keep threatening to come down and buy you dinner because I owe you for doing so many of my radio shows and being so helpful, particular today. Thank you very, very much for joining us. Sure, sure. And let's do, let's do dinner. Thanks very much, Rudy. I'd like that. And to our visitors today, thank you for tuning in. We'll post this on YouTube so that the rest of the world can see it. Tell all your friends and we'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.